history depends on documents. And uh, a peculiarity of recent history is that some of the documents talk back. So I'm a document and I'm going to talk to you, uh, which is a strange role to be in here. I'm not here as a critic of the exhibition in any sense at all. I'm here to add another couche of memoir to the solid bedrock of history that uh, Joachim has uh, provided. So one of my tasks in each room is to say, you know, what do we have here? We have behind you the four, well, three founding fathers and the founding mother of the Open University, and I'll say something about that in a, in a minute. We have uh, a, an image, that's me incidentally there. Um, we have uh, an image of the transmission of the uh, TV programs and radio programs throughout the country. Uh, which is part of uh, Joachim's theme, is this, this use of media in the diffusion of this, this course. Uh, and we have a sort of organigram of the first few years of the Open University, and this is where I come in. In May 1970, uh, I was the first batch of younger people. There was a first group of professors and people who met in an office, and then I was the first batch of real workers who were going to create the courses from May 1970, and I worked in the Open University until 2010. So I'm a, I'm a company man, if you like. So what I'd like Joachim now to do is to represent what he's written on the wall there, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the objectives of the exhibition. Yes. Um, this exhibition started as, um, with the provisional title was called MOOCs Archaeology. It was indeed an archaeology. It was trying to look at a past that was not described historically. It had somehow disappeared, and the questions were, why? Why all these material had disappeared? Why wouldn't you find the digital traces? Why was not all on YouTube? Why you still could buy all these things if you just searched? That's why it was called... Uh, MOOCs, uh, archaeology. It was an inquiry into A305 and an inquiry into its time. Huh? How I tried to, to thematize, I think uh, Tim was always, no, and I understand incredibly, very, very concerned with the student experience. And I think I was very, very interested in everything else. No? In, all, in the audience of the BBC, no? in what everybody was seeing. It was uh, this excess. No? This was not a traditional uh, course no? in an architecture school. And yet, it was being used in architecture schools. It was transforming the relation of, uh, of architecture and society. That was the scope of the archaeology. And it was a way to study that thing that, for a lack of a better word, we still call post-modernity. No? It's an archaeology of things that disappear in different ways, that volatize in different ways. So that was a little bit, uh, no? And thank you very much. I think uh, that we can have an enhanced version of the exhibition is just an extraordinary thing. Thank you, Tim. OK, great. So as uh, Joachim has said, I I'm I've been at Les constantly trying to get me to say what's missing in the, in the show. So as a, as a running theme, what's missing is the people. Okay. Uh, in any exhibition, you have things and you don't have people. And this is particularly important for an exhibition about uh, education and learning because the central object is the living person, the individual. Okay. So I'm going to say, for example, about... Um, the founding fathers and mothers, we have uh, Peter Venables, the president of the, of the planning committee. Uh, we have Geoffrey Crowther, who is the first chancellor. We have Harold Wilson, the prime minister of Great Britain, a uh, labor politician uh, who launched the Open University. And Jenny Lee, who is the firebrand widow of Nye Bevan, the great hero of, of uh, trade union socialism, also a minister during the war and so forth. And she was the one with the fire in her belly who really pushed this, this project through. I want to add two more people. 
Uh, one is Walter Perry, the first vice chancellor. There he is there. He was a wonderful figure, Scottish, well-living person. He, he, he liked his, he liked his uh, single malt. Uh, there, we used to have events where he would invite you know, staff for uh, away days and evenings, and it always went on late into the night with him playing his guitar and singing rather raunchy songs. Uh, he, was a, he, was a great, uh, he was a great figure, but he introduced something which is very important to the Open University, uh, which was the idea of interdisciplinarity right from the beginning. And this is embedded in Scottish education and not in British education. The Scottish university degree is a four-year degree, and the first year is an interdisciplinary first year. And we adopted that right from the beginning as our method of teaching in the Open University. The other person I would like to, to add is the second chancellor after Geoffrey Crowther, uh, Baron Gardner. He was the Lord High Chancellor under Labour, the top judge of the country. Uh, he's known to all uh, 68 hours like myself, uh, fondly remembered as the defender uh, in the, um, <coughs> the, the case, the obscenity case of Lady Chatterley's lover. Uh, but he, would, he, like many senior academics, he started a tradition uh, of top people in, in the university of becoming a student. And he did a degree at the Open University in social science. And there's a very nice story that was uh, broadcast, in fact, of him discussing with a, an Open University student how they prepared for exams. And the student said, uh, well, what he did was he, he sent his wife and children off to, their, to her mother's for the weekend so that he could concentrate on, on revising. And uh, Lord Gardner said, yes, well, I do something similar. I check into a little hotel I know in Switzerland by a lake. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the key functions of the members of the course team, especially uh, Liz Dighton, the staff tutor, the staff tutor is the person in the regions who has the tutors, the local tutors, who have contact with the students. And her job in all course team meetings and all discussions was to say, think of the student. Think of the student. So um, what is the student going to make of this? And don't be too technical, don't be too uh, professorial, and so forth. And Ellie Mace, who was the, the member of the Institute of Educational Technology, who actually did surveys, about the, the course material and what the students actually thought of everything. And this, this was extremely important. If you had a bad survey from Eddie Mace, the course was taken off air. So, are you going to give me a cue or I start? That's your cue. That's my cue. Right. So, um, what are we seeing here? Now, as I've said, I'm going to be stressing people and Joachim has stressed process. So what you see here is a representation on the wall of the first 16 television programs in the course, which happened to be that part of the course which actually does the history of modern architecture. After TV 16, it, it's slightly complicated because the numbers got out of sync, but basically after, after TV 16, it becomes much more general about different kinds of buildings especially in England, and I'll explain why that is. And here are these wonderful period TVs, and you are being a student, okay? So you are the missing, the missing person here, yeah, the, the student. Because one of the things about the model of transmission, of the one-to-many transmission, is this idea of the mass media, okay? Individuals watching are not mass, they're individuals. And uh, with that, what that means is, in terms of architecture and design, for example, is you, you're trying to talk about modern architecture, the development of modern architecture, and they're sitting at home in their little house, um, which is not modern. And our students, uh, adults, we, didn't, we don't own them. We don't, we're not able to seduce them in the way that Joachim with his students in Lisbon, for example, uh, completely convinces them of, of, the, of the value of his uh, ethos and uh, so forth. That relationship between a teacher and their student, which you have with students which are in front of you, is quite different when they're at the end of a television thing. You can't actually see them, 
and they are, they are adults and they have their own culture developed. The other thing, actually, could you go back one? One more. The wife. Uh, when a student gets their degree, we have a, a confirmation ceremony, often in a cathedral, because there are a lot of students. When, when, I, when I quit the Open University, when I was retired from the Open University in 2010, we had 250,000 students. So the, the, the congregation ceremonies, for example, in uh, the East Anglia region, I, I lived then in Cambridge, we would fill Ely Cathedral, the nave of Ely Cathedral. And we would have the students on one side and the families on the other. And it was one of the things that whoever was running the ceremony would do is you would you have a speech about the families, the sacrifice of the families, and we would all applaud the families. So again, this is, this is a feature about kind of mass distribution, which is the, the strange sociology. You're actually teaching the family and so forth. And there's a wonderful photograph in the later room where you see the man doing his design course, uh, the wife doing her chemistry in the kitchen, and their child preparing his uh, work for school. You know. And this is the model of lifelong learning, which the Open University is all about and which has been sadly completely betrayed by uh, current government, in fact, even the Labour government before that. So lifelong learning and the University of the Second Chance are the two slogans of, of the Open University. I have a question. Yes. Oh, yes. How did you recruit students? Uh, How did you, I mean, you start up in Endeavour, yeah. and then what happened? Well, we had a bit of advertising, but not very much. Um, and no, it was, it was word of mouth. Um, the foundation course is recruited for the other courses. How did we get the students into the foundation courses? We, there were a lot of links into existing teaching structures. So there were evening classes. There was the Workers' Education Council. And so we recruited a lot of our students from them. We had a lot of teachers in the first few years because a teacher could get their fees paid for by their school and often they could improve their status in the school by studying art history or by studying literature or something they could become you know get an, an extra grade or whatever so there's continual education supported by schools so in the early days we had a lot of teachers um, and word of mouth in various um, surveys that were done word of mouth was 40% of students joining said that word of mouth was the main reason for joining. And again, the families are important there, you know. Um, it, it goes around the village, you know. Somebody's doing the Open University and then it picks up. Advertising was, frankly, pathetic in the first days of the Open University. <laughs> yeah. This is the, uh, the timetabling. So our TV programs were shown on uh, TV, on, on BBC. So you, know, it, you can see it here. Uh, in the morning uh, of Wednesdays, for example, you have some programs about animals, animal kingdom, chemistry of carbon compounds, etc. Then there's play school for, sc for school kids. Uh, and then it comes back to the Open University. And you, this, this program, An Architect at Work, 525 in the afternoon of a Wednesday is TV1 of A305. So it's embedded into uh, the public sector broadcasting of the BBC. And that's good from one point of view and bad from another point of view. It's good from the point of view that we had audiences, according to the scheduling, of up to 40, 50,000 people who were not our students. To the point where uh, this was a big political problem that we were taking up uh, a slot which in BBC terms was a minority slot. 40,000 is very small for mass broadcasting where you're, you want millions. Okay? But it's very big for an educational thing. You know, how, do you, how do you get that number of people to watch academic programs with people like me being academic and not proper professional presenters being, doing info to entertainment? So that was, that was a, a, a wonderful thing. Um, and that went after a while. The BBC hated us. 
because we produce programs that won prizes at one-tenth of the cost of the programs that they did, and sometimes didn't win prizes. Uh, we, we won two prizes in 1976, for example, for television programs for this course. Uh, so quite soon, they moved us on to nighttime broadcasting. And as soon as video recording came along, then it became basically narrow casting again. You know, we, 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 were, we were broadcasting to insomniacs and video recorders. And here's a, a, a student, a housewife with five children, uh, who says, there are various disadvantages in the OU courses for the housewife. Work continues during school holidays, with summer schools in the middle of the summer holidays. The television and radio programs in the early evening and at weekends could hardly be at a worse time and the tutorial and counseling sessions are often at times when the family is around. So if you think about it, Saturday morning, what are you doing with your five children? Saturday morning you're going shopping, you're looking after the children, a Wednesday evening you're preparing the meal, you know, and so forth. So it, it, it wasn't easy. And we have, we have statistics which I can sort of talk about a little bit later of the proportion of students who actually watched the broadcast. It wasn't 100% for all these reasons. And also for other reasons. Some of our students are in prison. Some of them were long distance uh, uh, truck drivers. Some of them worked on oil rigs. Um, and some people were functional and they read what they needed to get through the assessment, which was the books. And they watched the programs if they had the time, but they didn't see them as essential. The other thing, which is all to do with people, which is about the relationship between OU students on A305 and the subject of architectural history, is that normally, you know, you teach architectural history to architects. And architects are supposed to be able to read plans. Architecture students are supposed to be able to read plans. You know, you need to be able to read music to follow a music course. We had to teach them to read plans. And this was a major investment. This was a plan reading guide that we made. But the investment behind it was that every single plan in the course units was redrawn to the same standard so that students could read them. And so here, here there's a version of Mises Dugendau's house. And there's a version of a, a, a building by Bailey Scott, Bexley Croft. Uh, and they're, they're actually adapted to include more features. Um, and uh, th there's a guide that tells you how to interpret each element in the plan. And then there's a, on the back of it, there's uh, some, in some instructions or some advice on how to read a plan. And reading a plan means imagining that you can walk into a building from a plan. What would you see? And the, the associated skill how do you identify the two or three photographs of the building which are printed in the unit by looking at the plan? And this is essential teaching. Uh, I think some architecture students could do with it as well. Actually. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, the OU, like any organization, did some very, very stupid things and it did some very good things. This is one of the good things. You, when you registered as a student, you paid a fee, which is a third of the full fee. And for that, you, you could get the first month of instruction, which was the whole of this, which you didn't have to send back if you decided not to do it. And there's something that Joachim has rightly put a lot of emphasis on, is that not only did we have this drop-in TV audience who were not students, but we also had an audience, you can see over there, among architects. Uh, that's, that's the case that, that's in Building Magazine, which is the professional architecture magazine in, in, in Britain. Uh, there's an article about that, and then it, there's a German uh, review of the course. Uh, and uh, th this is a, th a little article I did in our uh, in-house magazine in which I interest people, other people in the rest of the university and so forth, uh, and other students because all the students had this, uh, to you know, persuade them that this course was interesting. So w we're speaking to several different audiences. And this creates uh, a language problem, if you like, as well, that uh, you, have to, you have to talk in, the, in an accessible language. Every student belonged to a tutor group. So there were 25 students to a tutor. And the students were on Christian name terms with each other. They had their own, t this is before the web, you know, before, but they had their telephone numbers. When they lived in cities, they met together in self-help groups. They had tea together and such like. Uh, they, had, they planned strategies for the assignments. Uh, and they knew their tutors by first name terms as well. So th they, they weren't completely alone uh, uh, at all. And they had um, day schools, which were events that happened, uh, say, two or three times in the year, where you'd have a whole day, like a little, little um, workshop, and students would come in for that. And there were study centers. This is the, the, the part of the second half of the exhibition, that, of, of the course that I was trying to explain, which is not about the development of the history of modern architecture through, from Art, Art Nouveau through Le Corbusier to the international style and so forth. This is about the kind of thing that the students might do for their project. Because at the end of the course, there were eight weeks where students had free time to do a project. And the project was finding a building or a design object or something, uh, describing it, describing it with photographs and words and plans and so forth, doing its history, including they had to get primary material, they had to get original plans and original photographs if they could, uh, anything they could find uh, originally and even uh, eyewitness accounts and so forth. And the third and the most difficult part, because these three parts were marked separately, was to relate that object to the course, to the history of modern architecture. Because a majority of the projects that they did, there isn't that much good modern architecture in Britain from the 30s. Um, so if you live in Doncaster, you know, there is no work by Lubetkin or something like that in Doncaster. So you have to do the co-op building, say, as one student did a project on the co-op, which is a kind of art deco building. Or they did the local church, or they did a town hall, or they did a library building from the 1890s, or whatever. And this sort of uh, material was designed to help them uh, find subjects, if you like, for their projects. Uh, we had to make an application to a thing called the Broadcasting and Audiovisual Subcommittee to get the money to do our TV and radio. And the chairman of that committee, who was a, a physicist, in fact, said, but buildings don't move. Okay. And there are two arguments against that, a good argument and a bad argument as far as that's concerned. The bad argument is, well, actually in a TV program, in 20 minutes of a TV program, you can include so much information, visual information, even if it's still photographs, that you simply cannot get with 120 illustrations for a week's work uh, in, in a unit. That's the bad argument. That wouldn't have won. So, so what we said was, yes, but the cameras move. Okay. The trouble was, getting a BBC cameraman to get his camera off the tripod and move it was extremely difficult in those days. And uh, it was the genius of Nick Levinson, who was uh, the, the best of the, of the producers, to do things like this, where we put the camera on a, on a car and we, we move the, the camera. 
And there was a, a, a program we did on the Berlin Siedlungen, the housing estates in Berlin, where we had the good fortune that it rained the whole time. So the crew were very happy to film from a moving car. So I, we're showing this here to make the point that the course had quite a lot of design history in it. It wasn't just Adrian Forty, there was a lot of design. So this was one based on the, the question, wood or metal, which was the title of an article uh, published in 1930 in the studio by Charlotte Perriand, who walked, worked with Le Corbusier, but also at that time had an English husband and spoke English, wrote English and so forth. And uh, we start with um, uh, Charlotte Perriand uh, reading, it's not her, it's an actress, <laughs> read, reading uh, uh, the text for the beginning of this article. thing that with the BBC because of union agreements we had a choice of any actor or actress we wanted I mean Shakespearean actors the top actors they all cost the same okay. uh, but we had incredible difficulty getting professional actors to sound like ordinary people <laughs> and uh, th this is one of the things that we as, as presenters we squirmed about this kind of thing I mean it was it was terrible but um, it was very difficult to control it. The other thing is, I mean, that's, this is an example of a program which uh, was mixed with a studio. We had a bit in the studio with pieces of furniture. And then there was also film. We filmed in Heels uh, wood workshops, and we filmed in, a, um, in Hilly's. Hilly was a company that made tubular steel furniture at that time, uh, making uh, tubular steel chairs. And the point was to show that far from what Charlotte Perignon said, uh, there was much more hand craftsmanship that went into a tubular steel chair than in a wooden chair. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the join in the, 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 the Mies van der Rohe chair, just that X join, had 19 hours of work. <laughs> in, uh, and two of the programs were of Berthold Lubetkin. Berthold Lubetkin was really the best of the architects practicing in the 1930s born in, in, in Russia, actually, in, in Poland, well, in what is now Poland, and uh, came to France, designed some buildings in France, and then came to England, married an English wife, and became really the, the leading theorist and architect of modernism in, in England. And after the war, he did some housing estates, and he was made the chief architect for a new town called Peter Lee. And he, became very upset because he was convinced that the government had set him up uh, for what was effectively the closure of all the mines in the, the coal mines in the area. And he retired. He disappeared. He dropped out from public life. He bought a farm in Hereford and uh, went, to, went to ground. Okay. And we were in a course team meeting. And we, you know, we got the various people, Summerson, uh, Julius Posner, lots of people who did radio programs for us. And I was saying, who else could we get? And I said, Lubetkin, he's dead, isn't he? Oh, no, he's got this farm. You know, he, 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 he's no good. And the radio producer, Helen Rapp, who is the daughter of a Russian general, uh, belong, belonged to a, a, a thriving white Russian community in London, uh, she said, Tolly, but I see him all the time, you know, and picked up the phone and we got uh, uh, the, the programs. 
And it was amazing because it was like a kind of spy story that he was extremely <laughs> suspicious. Uh, so a meeting was arranged in the Langham Hotel, which belonged to the BBC in front of Broadcasting House, where uh, I was kind of put to the test. And we had this meeting, and I, I wasn't at all sure how it, how it went, because I did most of the talking and so forth, and he kind of listened and grunted. But it, it got better because the next thing, uh, we had a lunch in the Swiss uh, center in London and Leicester Square, which is his favorite restaurant. And then he begin to, began to open up a bit. And so he agreed to do a radio program. And I said I would send him some questions so that he could prepare and so forth. And so the time came and he was sitting down in the, in, in the radio studio and I was opposite him and I asked him the first question. And he kind of slapped his head and said, oh, I don't know, no, as if he'd never seen the question before. <laughs> and so that didn't go very well. So I tried the second question and said, oh, the same thing. And I realized that he had a script that was on his knees. So I said, well, look, should we stop there for a minute? No, would you like to read your script? <laughs> and, and the first of the radio programs is Lubetkin reading his script, which is pretty unintelligible. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect document of avant-garde rhetoric. Uh, two other wonderful courses that Joachim could have done this whole exhibition on either of those two courses. Uh, on the left was <laughs> TAD 292. You see, I'm being generous here. <laughs> <laughs> TAD 292 was an incredible course. They shared summer school with us. And this is them uh, with a kind of uh, a whole earth globe, which they've blown up. Um, TAD 292 was a creative a course about creativity. Uh, and it had a number of units about different kinds of creativity, drawing, writing, making music. Uh, for example, there was a, uh, two weeks on music where the task was you had to make a musical instrument. And then the assessment was a cassette on which you played something on the musical instrument. Okay. <laughs> uh, there was another project, the, main, the final project of the whole course, was the students were sent in flat pack uh, a one foot cube box. And the assessment was to put something in it. <laughs> it could be anything. And if you imagine the, the, the GPO, the General Post Office, mailing, it was bad enough mailing you know, all these units out, but to get 500 or whatever it was, one foot square, fragile boxes with something inside. Uh, um, a, the General Post Office Act of 1906 made it an offense to send certain things by the mail. So it created huge problems. Uh, um, you know, they had to open the boxes to make sure it wasn't a bomb and it wasn't uh, obscene material or, or something like that. So that was TAD 292. It was a history of architecture course, but it was related to big themes in, of the time. SV5 was, was written at a time when modernism was in terminal decline. Are we projecting? We're not projecting. Oh, there we are, yes. yes. Sorry. Pruitt Igo, of course, 1972 is the famous American example uh, uh, used by, by Charlie Jenks and so forth. Uh, our example is uh, the, the one in 68 of the collapse of the corner of Ronan Point Tower Block. And these were both symbolic events that were seen as the, you know, the, the last nail in the coffin of, of modernism. And all the faults of uh, mass-produced housing were, were drawn attention to. So we made a film, part of which was about Quarry Hill Estates in Leeds, uh, which was a 1930s estate based on uh, Viennese uh, red superblock um, apartment schemes like the, the Karl Marx Hof in, in um, Vienna. And we, we, we filmed it, we, we showed all the systems and so forth, but in the knowledge that Quarry Hill Flats was under threat, it was, parts of it were already being abandoned and, and vandalized. Um, and sure enough, in the lifetime of the course, it was demolished, and one of my students did his project on Quarry Hill's de demolition and took photographs of the, of the destruction of it. So there was this whole thing that we felt that we had to engage with one of the key issues of the time. But I, I defend the idea that history doesn't work unless you put yourself into it. And uh, all the way through the course, we tried to do that. The first TV program 
was one of the authors of the course, an architect, showing us the house that he had designed. And the, the idea of the house and living, which is something which is most people's entry into architecture, was maintained all the way through. And so that's why we, we finished that uh, in, in that, uh, in that vein. So any, any questions?